morning, man. I'm glad you guys are here. I hope you enjoyed worship. And uh, if you're new to Sandals Church or this is your first time, you came in the worst weekend ever. And this is why. The chapter that we're going to study today, the, 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 the Luke chapter 6, is the hardest chapter in the Gospel of Luke to actually do. There are things in here that you wish God would have never have put in there. there you are going to be challenged more deeply than you have ever been challenged in your life. Luke chapter 6 literally is the boot camp of what it means to be a Christian. So I just want to begin with a word of prayer, praying for us, because there's some of you going to be like, I'm not doing that. And so, um, you know, okay, well, you're going to go to hell. So, you know, try, just try your best and just know that none of us can do these things without Christ in us. None of us can love this way. None of us can turn away from anger this way. None of us are capable on our own strength to do what Jesus Christ is asking us to do. We need him in us, working through us to accomplish what he's asked us to do. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, I just pray, Lord, for those of us who have gathered today, Luke 6 is the most difficult chapter in the gospel to actually be obedient to. God, so I pray that we would hear your words clearly and God, I pray that we would at least make an attempt to live these things out in our lives with our friends and our family member and our neighbors. So God, bless my words, bless our he ears so that we can hear your truth. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. So today's message is entitled, How to Become Like Jesus. And so a lot of you guys don't know what it means to be a Christian. For most of us, we think it means I think a, a certain way about certain things or I've invited Jesus Christ into my heart and, and we have all these ideas of what it looks like to be a Christian. And I want you to know that for Jesus, his understanding of what it meant to be a Christ follower was this, that you would become like him, that you would learn to think like him, that you would learn to feel like him, and ultimately that you would learn to act like him, that you would change fundamentally who you are, the way you think, act, and feel. And the problem is, a lot of Christians wear the Christian t-shirt, but they don't think anything like Jesus, they don't feel anything like Jesus, and they certainly don't act anything like Jesus. And so Jesus is going to call together his 12 followers, the 12 apostles, and he, he is going to begin to teach them what it means to be a follower of Jesus. What does it mean to be my disciple? And he's going to lay this out. Now, we're not going to cover everything in Luke 6. You need to do that on your own. Um, and let me just say this. If you don't get discouraged as you read through Luke 6, you didn't read it. So read it again because what he's asking you to do is impossible, humanly speaking. So let's take a look at it as he gathers his disciples, Luke 6, 12 through 14. It says, one day soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountaintop to pray. And underline this word. It says he prayed all night to God. You see, Jesus had a big decision looming. Last week we talked about he healed the leper, he, he healed the paralyzed man, and he has now become the most famous person in Israel. There is no one more famous. Caesar's not more famous. The governor Pilate's not more famous. King Herod is not more famous. Jesus is the celebrity. He is the superstar. Everywhere he goes, people gather to hear him preach and to hear him speak. And so now he's got all these followers, and out of these literally hundreds and potentially thousands of people, he's got to whittle it down to 12 guys, 12 guys that I'm going to pour into so that they can change the world ultimately and spread my gospel, spread my good news. And so he has a big decision, and so he prays all night for God's guidance and God's wisdom. And I would just encourage you as a Christian, if you have a big decision, if you're, if you're going to get engaged, if you're going to buy a house, if you're talking about having children, you're talking about changing a job. Consult God, pray to God, go to God for wisdom. If Jesus needed to go to God for wisdom, what does that say about you? Okay, we all need to do this. So he prayed all night. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples, the whole group. And he chose from all of them, 12 of them, to be his apostles. And here are the names. Simon, who he named Peter, Andrew, Peter's brother, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus. Why? Because there's two Jameses. Simon, who was called the zealot. That means crazy. That's religious for crazy. Okay. Judas, the son of James, and then Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. Okay. I would never encourage you to memorize all these names. And, and here's why. Because they're listed differently in different gospels. Why is that? Because in the ancient world, to confuse people, you had multiple names. Okay, so I'm just saying this, it's great if you're on Jeopardy one day, you might win some money, but what I want, what I think is more important than memorizing the names of the disciples is learning what they were challenged to become. So write this down. It's not important who they were. What's important is what they were challenged to become. For many of you, you're, you're trying to, to, to outrun your past. You've made mistakes. If you could go back 
uh, and make life different, you would. And let me just say this. It's not nearly as important, you know, where you've been or what you've done. What's important is where you're going and what you're going to do. You can't change your past. You can't fix your past. All you can change is today, and ultimately that will change your future. So God wants to change you. God wants to challenge you. God wants to alter the future of your life. And so he calls these 12 guys together and he says, it doesn't matter who you are, where you were, or what you were doing. I have called you together. Okay, different people, tax collectors, fishermen, you know, crazy people. Then there's Judas, you know, the money guy. There's all these people. And he says, I'm going to transform you to become like me. Listen to what Jesus says. Then Jesus gave the following illustration. He says, can a blind person lead another person? No. He says, won't they both fall into a ditch? He says, students are not greater than their teacher. Underline this word, these words. But the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. So what's Jesus saying to his students? You will become like me. This is what it means to be a Christian. So as you evaluate your Christian life, don't judge yourself based upon your friends who are Christians because you know what we do? We find the loser Christians. That's who, we, that's who we compare it. Well, at least I'm not like Sally. Look at her. Look at her. I'm not like her. She's probably not even going to heaven. Okay? Right? We, we, judge, we judge ourselves based upon people that are worse than us. Just like when you go to the gym. You don't look at the fit people. You look at the, you know, change of vowel. That's the people you look at. Well, I'm not like them. So that's what we do. We need to compare ourselves not to each other, but to Jesus. Are you like Jesus? Are you thinking like Jesus? Do you feel like Jesus? Are you acting like Jesus? Okay? So to become more like Jesus, I need to change fundamentally really four things. Number one, I need to change the way I evaluate my life. I don't know if you've noticed this, but as Americans, we are very discouraged. We're very dissatisfied with our lives. We don't feel successful. No matter how much money we make, no matter how many blessings we incur, we just don't feel successful. And this is the reason that as Americans, we are the most medicated society in the world. We have to pop pills because we don't feel good about ourselves. Okay, why? Because the world says you're never successful enough. You don't make enough money. You're not skinny enough. You're not fit enough. You're not young enough. You're not old enough. You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. And so we're constantly evaluating ourselves on this treadmill where no one wins and we all feel unloved, unimportant, and unsuccessful. And that's just the reality. I mean, so many of you today, you don't feel like you have any friends because you only got four likes on your Instagram post. You're just like, nobody loves me. I don't have a Facebook friend. Jesus didn't have any Facebook friends. Okay, you're not alone. Do you know that people will actually create false accounts so they can like their own stuff? I mean, not you, but people. People. Isn't that crazy? It always amazes me, people who like their own posts. You ever notice that? You post it, then you like it. Well, I know you like it because you posted it. That's kind of cheating, right, to like your own post. But that's what we do. And we, and we, and we feel, right, if, if, I, if I get, you know, 100 likes, then, then I'm successful. And if I get no likes, then, then I'm depressed. And that's, and that's the way it is, is we're, we're constantly, you know, on Enviagram, looking at all these people, saying, I, 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 I'm not, you know, pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't get to go to these places. I don't get to do these things. And so we feel depressed and discouraged. And let me just say this to you. If you don't allow Jesus to change your version of success, you're going to be a very depressed, discouraged Christian. Because what you're going to find is God doesn't care about our version of success. He's not into it. It doesn't phase him. And so we need to look at his version of success. So Jesus says this in Luke 6. He lifted up his eyes, underline these words, on his disciples. Now there's two really famous sermons in the Bible. One is called the Sermon on the Mount, which I'm sure many of you have heard of or you're at least familiar with. The Sermon on the Mount, and then there's this one, the Sermon on the Plain. And they're really the same sermon. Why? Because Jesus had to teach it more than once. He had to talk about these issues more than once. And so listen to what he says. He lifted up his eyes upon his disciples, and he said, underline these words. He said, blessed are you who are poor. Anybody disagree with Jesus? You do. You do. You're just lying because you're, you're oh, I can't disagree with you. You disagree with Jesus. What, when do we feel like we're blessed? When we get a raise, when we get a bonus, when we win the lottery, okay? Nobody goes to community group, I'm so blessed this week. Why? I lost my job. I'm so blessed this week. I got a 10% decrease in pay. I'm so blessed this week. I did not win the lottery. Jesus loves me. That's why I didn't win. Nobody feels this way. Nobody thinks this way. Jesus says, 
Your success is not defined by the money you make. And he says, are you listening, Judas? Why? When you read the Gospels, you know what Judas is always upset about? Money. He's always upset about money, how Jesus is spending money. I think Jesus is just, just frivolous with money. And he's always concerned. And ultimately, Judas, you know why he sells out Jesus? It's for money. He sells him out for money. And so Jesus is saying, if you're going to be my disciple and you believe that blessings from God are always monetary, always financial, you're going to be a very miserable person. Judas, are you listening? He says, blessed are you who are poor. He says, for yours is the kingdom of God. Jesus, okay, is not offering a great 401k. He's not offering a great salary to come follow him. Judas, what are we paying everybody again? Zero, right, zero. Okay, Jesus is so broke that when he goes for a picnic, he's got to take a lunch from a little kid to feed everybody. That's, that's how it is. When he goes to pay his taxes, he tells Simon Peter to go fish and they get the coin out of the, out of the fish's mouth. He has no money. He has no house. Okay, they have to hijack a donkey for his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Read the Gospels. That's what he says. Just tell them I need it. You go try to take a car that way. My master has need of it. Right? You're going to go to jail. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Listen to this. Blessed are you who are hungry. Really? Hungry people are blessed. Starving people are blessed. Okay? Jesus isn't providing snack lunches every day. Remember when he says feed the 5,000? He tells the disciples, you feed them. That's a you problem. What? He says, blessed are you who are hungry, for you shall be satisfied. Look at this one. Bless, blessed are you who weep now. Anybody depressed, discouraged? Next time you're popping a Prozac, go, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I am super blessed because I am super depressed. That's what he says. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus says, blessed are you when you realize life isn't awesome. When it isn't awesome. God wants you to know that something is incredibly broken in life. And it cannot be fixed by our politicians. It can't be fixed by our power. It can't be fixed by your changes. There's something irreparably wrong with the earth. It's broken. Blessed are you. I love this one. I must be really blessed. Blessed are you and people hate you. I am super hated. You don't believe me? Follow me on Twitter. You will see what people say. Someone, you know, sent me an email this week. Says Sandals Church is the worst church on earth. That wow. No one is worse than no. <laughs> Not even like the cults. No. Okay. Well, have you read Corinthians? Right. I mean, they got to be in the top ten. That's why they got two books. That was funny. You'll get that on the way home. <laughs> These guys were knuckleheads. Worst church ever. Worst pastor ever. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Really, it's something I said. The stupidest thing I've ever heard. Wow. People love to hate. Okay, I don't just be like, man, Jesus loves me. Why? Look at all this hate mail. Right? Look at this one. He says, blessed are you when people hate you. Circle this one, ladies, when they exclude you. Ooh. My wife and I, we are so different. Like when we don't get invited to a party, my wife's hurt. Just depressed, discouraged. I'm like, Phew. thanks. <laughs> oh man, avoided that one. It, right, guys? We, we don't want to go to celebrate anyone. I'm going to sit here and watch this TV. <laughs> right? I mean, guys, if it wasn't for women, we would celebrate no one. You want to know why I'm at the party? My wife, she made me come. She said, you're going. Okay. When next time you get excluded, I'm blessed. Jesus is always excluded. When people revile you and spurn you, spurn your name as evil. I just hate that Matt. Hate it. It's not my fault. My parents gave me the name. Okay? Right? Jesus is saying people aren't going to love you. You know when you stand up for Jesus, when you tell people you're a follower, people aren't going to celebrate you. They're going to hate you. When you make a stand for Jesus, and I'm not telling you to be a jerk for Jesus, but when you stand up for Jesus, people are not going to celebrate you. They're going to loathe you. Oh, here comes that Jesus lover. 
They're going to get their Jesus goo all over me. I had a person tell me this one time, don't you pull your Jesus voodoo on me. <laughs> Jesus voodoo? Those are different religions. <laughs> you can't use different religions to illustrate a negative statement about me. Right? Okay, so he says, blessed are the poor. But listen, he goes on, he says, woe to you who are rich. You're like, well, I ain't got that problem. <laughs> woe. Woe to you who are rich. He says, for you have received your consolation. What it actually means is you've received your blessing now. So you don't have a lot to look forward to in the next life. Because God has blessed you now. Woe. Woe to you who are full now. Another way to translate that is fat and happy. Yeah, that's offensive. Welcome to Jesus. For you shall die hungry. Whoa, that's kind of rough. You know. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. He says, woe to you when people speak well of you. You know, Jesus actually says popularity is a very bad thing. He says, success is not quantified by the amount of people who like you. And some of you guys, the number one reason you're so miserable is because you're constantly trying to impress people. And they're never going to like you. They're never going to lie. I, I used to be that guy. I'd do like the, you know, look at me, look at me, look at me. They don't care. They don't care. I'm like, I'm so sad. They don't like me. They don't. And you're going to be miserable. You're never going to be skinny enough. You're not going to be strong enough. You're never going to be smart enough. You're never going to be good looking enough. You're not going to be. It's not, a, it's not a popular contest. It's not about being beautiful. You know, the book of Isaiah says Jesus was ugly. It says that people hid their face from him. That's what Jesus looked like. Why? Because he wanted us to listen to his words, not look at his face. You see, Jesus wasn't popular in any, any way, shape, or form until he began to do the things of God. And then even then, he was just as hated as he was loved. So I've got to change the way that I look at myself. And so let me just say this. Some of you are so critical of yourself because you're judging yourself not based upon anything that God says you should care about. And not only that, but you're asking for God in your prayer time for things he doesn't want you to have. You're asking God for more wealth and you can't handle the wealth you have. You ever watch one of those specials about the people who actually win the lottery? Like they get divorced, or lives fall apart. It's just, it's terrible. And we're all asking God for more money. And God says, man, you can't handle what you have. So I need to change the way I evaluate my life. Next, I got to change the way I evaluate people. Underline these words. It says, don't judge others. Okay, just write in there, I do this all the time. You do, we, we are constantly, you know how you should translate this from the Greek to the English? So it's written in the Greek and we translate, you should translate it this way. Stop judging people. Because Jesus assumes, not that you will do this someday in the future, <laughs> he assumes you're doing it right now. So he is telling his disciples on the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, he's saying, stop judging people. They're probably judging each other. And Judas is saying, I don't know why Peter's in charge. I don't know why. I'm, I'm the one with clear leadership potential. We're constantly overly critical of everyone else. We're constantly judging people. Well, I don't know what their problem is. Look at their kids. Oh, my gosh. Look at their kids. Oh, look at her wife. Oh, that's unfortunate right? I mean, you don't say those things out loud, but you think them, right? Somebody snorted. That was good. I like that. <laughs> Makes me feel good. All right. Don't judge others and you will not be judged. Don't condemn others and, or it will come back against you. And let me say this. God is not saying that you need to be ignorant of what's right and wrong. Okay. You need to have judgment God, Jesus doesn't want you to be stupid for Jesus. You need to know what's right. You need to know what's wrong. You just don't need to be overly critical of people. You don't need to run around being the Holy Spirit for everyone else. That's not your job. Matter of fact, Jesus says in Luke 6 that your primary job is to take the log out of your eye before you help your brother with the speck in theirs. And he says, maybe you would be of more benefit to people if you could actually see clear. But the truth is, we're more aware of the faults of others than we are of our own. We are. We are. 
Like I am more critical of other parents when they blow it with their kids than I am of me, right? When I, when I lose my, my temper on my kids, they deserve it. But when you lose your temper on your kids, you have a problem. I'm gonna pray for you, right? I could say, listen, it says, forgive others and you will be forgiven. Okay, part of being a Christian means this. You've received grace. Let me define grace for you. Grace is forgiveness you didn't deserve. You hurt God, you've wounded God, you've rebelled against God, you've asked for forgiveness and he has granted it to you. He has given it to you. Maybe the reason you can't forgive others is you haven't actually received it yourself. So Jesus says, we're going to be in the business of forgiving others. He says this, if you love only those who love you, he says, why should you get credit for that? You see, it's easy to love people when they love us. He says, even sinners do love those who love them. He says, and if you're only good to those who do good to you, then why should you get credit for that? Like, it's easy to be kind and loving when you go to Chick-fil-A and they're like, my pleasure. You're like, oh, this is great. (laughs) My pleasure too. I mean, it's, right? it's, it's easy to love people who are loving. I mean, if you can't be loving to someone who's loving, what's wrong with you? It, you, know, you know, there are people in our lives, they're just nice, they're kind, they're good. You like to be around them. They're, they're wonderful people, okay? So do you think God should give you credit because you're nice to nice people? Well, good for you. Jesus says, that's what the world does. But I want you to love and to be nice to unloving people, to unkind people. And that's hard. Matter of fact, I think it's impossible. That's why we need Jesus. So Jesus wants me to change the way I evaluate people. You gotta learn to love people. You gotta learn to care about people. You gotta learn to see things from their perspective. I gotta change the way that I evaluate them. Now, I'm going to talk more about this. I'm, I'm starting up something new. I'm really excited about this. We're starting a podcast. If you don't know what that is, talk to them outside. Someone will tell you. But it's um, basically a digital recording. You can look up on iTunes. It'll be for free. And we're going to talk through all each week of the chapter that we cover. Because I can't cover everything that I want to cover in the sermon. And so we're going to talk about things deeper that we covered and things that we didn't cover. And I'm going to answer your questions about the text. So you can email your questions in and I'll try to answer them as best I can. But I just want to say this that this is probably the most difficult thing to do as a Christian. It's a tightrope. We don't want to tell people that evil is good, but we don't want to be so judgmental that they don't ever listen to us and don't know that they love us. And so we've got to learn how to walk this tightrope of having judgment, but not coming off as judgmental. And it's very, very difficult. And so we're going to talk about that in the podcast this week. And so you'll be finding out more information about it, but I'm super excited. Next, I've got to change the way I respond to hurtful people. Anybody ever in here been hurt by somebody? Raise your hands. Okay. It's, it hurts, right? It hurts. I, I, I have had people that I have loved, cared for, mentored, discipled. I've had people say horrible things about me. I've had people idolize me and then they demonize me. And it just hurts. Say terrible things about me. Talk behind my back. I've been called awful names. Liar. I I mean, cult leader. I've been called all kinds of things, just hurtful stuff. So how do we respond to them? Well, I want to punch them in the face. But I can't find that verse. Maybe you can help me find it. Right? So listen to Jesus. He says, for you who are willing to listen. This is a difficult teaching. But if you're a Christian, you need to listen. He says, I say love your enemies. I have a hard time loving my family. Anybody with me? Love your enemies. He says, do good to those who hate you. So next time you're on the 91, someone's like, F you. You're like, bless you. Bless you. He says, bless those who curse you. What? You know, I mean, what's the purpose of learning all those bad words if you don't get to use them? Right? But saving this, buddy. Pray for those who hurt you. This is just awful. If someone slaps you on the cheek, offer the other one. Is he crazy? Right? I mean, can, can you imagine? You offended me, Matt. 
Oh, opportunity to be obedient. <laughs> right? Kute. But you know what's amazing? You know who did this? Jesus did it. When he stood before the trial, not only did they slap him on the cheek, they ripped out his beard. Wow. Yeah. Right? And he did nothing. You see, I need to change the way I respond to hurtful people. I, I got to do this. Man, why? Because oftentimes we can't, we can't even respond in love to the people that we love when they hurt us. So last night at church, it was, it was hilarious. So you guys think I can't see you out there, but I can see you. And so a lot of times pastors are really old and they can't see anybody. I can still see. See all the way back there in the front side. I see you guys. Yeah, hi. Love you. So last night, don't tell anybody. But last night during service, there was a couple married and apparently they were in a fight when they came to church. And so they were like, <laughs> like during this message, they're going to hear this message and they're fighting. And so I, I'm, I'm trying to listen to what they're saying because <laughs> they're on the front row. I was trying to, you know how hard that is? I'm trying to listen while I'm preaching. And <laughs> eventually she gets so frustrated, she gets up and moves three seats. I'm not, I'm not making this up. And then we get to this part, right? What good is it if you love those who love you? She got convicted. She moved back. <laughs> it was great. It was so great. Like of all the times not to move, that was the one moment. She got Jesus slammed. It was awesome. All right. Okay, here... Here's the number one issue as Christians. So, so if you're new to Christianity, let me just say this. A lot of people love to play church. So what does that mean? We pretend to be something on the outside that we're not on the inside. So we do good things, right? So I go to church. I put money in the offering plate. I serve the kids. I work in the parking lot. And I do all these things. And I, and I have all this external evidence that says I'm a good person. Well, those things are all great. The problem is... Those things will never change what the problem is. Can you imagine if, if you went to Kaiser and you were diagnosed with terminal cancer and the doctor said, okay, here's the plan. You're going to take a really, really good bath and we're going to scrub your skin from head to toe. We're going to clean everything on the outside and that's how we're going to cure the cancer that's on the inside. You see, that doctor's crazy because the problem is not what's on the outside. The problem is the disease that's on the inside. And here's, here's where Jesus is so different, so radically different from every other religion on earth. Every other religion on earth assumes that God is impressed with the things that we do on the outside. When God says the problem is never the behavior on the outside, but the feelings on the inside that actually cause the behavior. And, so, and, and that's why the world is so disappointing. Like when you think about racism, you think about sexism. You think about, you know, income issues, all the issues, right, that politicians talk about. They believe that we can legislate laws, but the reality is what needs to change is not laws, it's hearts. And so God is in the business of changing your heart. So listen to what he says. Jesus says, hey, 12 guys, listen to me. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. An evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, what you say flows from what's in your heart. You ever done this, married people? Get in a fight, get angry, get upset, and all of a sudden, all of the, the prohibitors that keep you from saying the things you've always wanted to say phew, disappear, and all of a sudden, you're on the freeway, and you're just like, I hate your mother. I hate her. I've hated her from the day I met her. That woman is evil. And then later, you're like, oh, I didn't really mean that. What a, I'm really stressed out at work, and... You know, there's a lot of pressure. No, you meant it. You meant it. You just lost control and the truth came out. Okay, those moments are great moments to learn that it doesn't matter how religious you are, the heart is evil. And listen to me, those of you who are not Christians, here's what's so wrong with the advice of the world. The world says, follow your heart. God says, your heart is the problem. You know why people are going to be in hell? Because they followed their heart. Who's following my heart? Why is it so warm? Oh. <laughs> we in Palm Springs? I don't know what's going on. Oh. Wow. You know. Listen. 
I had a moment this last week where my heart, my heart just got revealed, right? I mean, how many of you guys think I'm a good guy? Raise your hands. I better see every hand raised. Okay, if you don't think I'm a good guy, why are you coming to this church? I go to church, my pastor's a moron. Okay, what does that say about you? Right? If your spiritual leader's a moron, I'm a little worried about you. Okay, I'm a pretty good guy. I try to be a good husband. I try to follow Jesus, right? I try just like you guys do. And I had a moment this week where my heart jumped out of my mouth. And it was embarrassing. Took my family up for a snow day. That's awesome. You know what that is? It's where you just set money on fire. <laughs> Watch it burn. <laughs> oh, $20 for a hamburger? Oh, okay. Why not? You know? Oh. So we're up there. We have a great day, great family day. We're all together. We're having a good time. We're having a good time. It's lunch break. We get together, ordering lunch. I paid, right? My kids didn't offer. I, like, I got it. It's on me. So we're sitting there, and my son is new to snowboarding. And snowboarding is not like skiing in that if you hit a flat spot, like skiing, you just, you know, you can get your way out. Snowboarding, you're miserable, and you, it's awful. And he kept getting stuck in this spot. And so I, as his father, a spiritual leader, tried to offer some direction for him as a snowboarder with more experience than his, like, three times, right? So, but, you know, when you give advice to teenagers, frontsiders, I love you, it's, re- it's scary. It's really scary. Because sometimes with teenagers, you say, I love you, but they hear, I hate you. That's what they hear. And so it's just frustrating. And so I tried to give some gentle correction, and it turned into a combative situation where he's rebuffing my leadership and spiritual guidance. And so he was a little rude and a little nasty. But, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to be like Jesus. And he would like slam, and I would just volley, you know, you know, (laughs) right? I don't know why I'm doing this, but it felt like tennis, you know? And so, like, for the first couple times, you know, he's like, that's stupid, that's crazy, you don't know what you're talking about, you know, and I'm like, I love you, and I'm here to help, and, and, I, and I care about you, and then all of a sudden, man, in my mind, my inner lawyer shows up, and he's like, you, you paid for this event, and he doesn't care, and you ought to just slam him right now, and I just got, I was getting angry and angry and angry, but you couldn't see on the outside, but in the inside, like, the devil was like, yeah, <laughs> and so, what, what, what I didn't tell you is, you know, at the beginning of this discussion, my wife said, I have to go to the bathroom, so she had left and gone to the bathroom, so she missed like the whole of me listening and hmm and being a hard handler and like being like Jesus. Like I was Jesus in snow clothes, right? I was just like hmm 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 And then I lost it. I lost it. And I couldn't take it anymore. And I'm not proud of this moment. This is not go and do like your pastor. You know, don't be like, well, the pastor does this, so I'm going to do it. No, don't do this. But all of a sudden, I just screamed. I lost. I lost it. You know what I'm talking about? There's that string in your brain. Bink. And I was like, Bleh! And I go, shut up. <laughs> Not proud of it. But right when I said that, shut up. And my finger's pointing at him. Out of the corner of my eye, I see his, my, my, his, my, my, my wife, his mom. <laughs> and I was like, oh. she's standing there and she's like, okay. And I was like, I need some time alone. I just, I just start walking. My wife's following me. Hey. I'm like, what? She's like, what's going on? I was like, you weren't there. I was just like Jesus. I was just like Jesus. I anointed him with oil. I mean, I didn't, right? She's like, well, you know, you are a spiritual leader. <laughs> She's like, when are you going to apologize? I'm not apologizing. I just preach about forgiveness. So I don't actually give it, receive it. You know, oh, so irritated. So we go up to the ski lift, and I'm going to go by myself because I need some alone time from my sinful family. And I get on the lift, and Ethan comes over, and he goes, hey, man. So can I ride up with you? I'm like, fine. So he gets on the lift with me, and he goes, I'm really sorry for my attitude. I was wrong. I love you, Dad. You're awesome. He's like, will you forgive me? Ha! Right? The 13-year-old has more Jesus in his heart than I do. So frustrating. So wait, here's what's amazing. Here, here, here's what's amazing. Listen to this. It gets worse. So I say, hey, son, um, I want to tell a story about you in church. Remember when I yelled at you to shut up? Remember that? This is what he said. No. No. 
I mean, if it would be me, I'd be like, oh yeah, you mean at 11.25 when we were sitting on the bench, you know? And Satan was on your face. You mean that moment? Yes. Yes. He didn't remember the moment. I was just like, man, double conviction. Oh, this is terrible. Okay? So, I got to change the way I respond to hurtful people. It's easy to be nice when people are nice. But when they're not nice, that's when you need Jesus. Right? Okay, last point. You guys are listening slow. I got to hurry up. I got to change the way I respond to hurting people. How many of you guys got to come to church last weekend? You raise your hands. Wasn't that awesome? It was incredible seeing people get prayed for, seeing lives touched. It was awesome. Let me share with you the highlight uh, for me. Um, We had amazing things happen at all campuses, at all services, but here was the highlight. We had a couple who came forward for prayer. And um, at one service in particular, I think the whole congregation came forward for prayer. I mean, like nobody, like everyone's like, I need prayer. (laughs) Everybody comes forward. And so the lines are literally going out to the exit signs. It was I was like, okay, we're going to be here till Tuesday. So we're like, okay, we need, we need mature Christians to come forward and pray. And then we didn't have enough. We need small group leaders to come forward and pray. And then we didn't have enough. And we're like, if you've ever thought about following Jesus, we need you to come forward and pray. Right? Like, if you're a Buddhist and you're here today, lay hands. I mean, it was, it was, it was like, it, I mean, it was that kind of situation. And here's what touched my life is there was, there was a couple that was in line to receive prayer who got out of line and began to pray, began to pray for people. And it just, when I heard that story, it just blessed my heart because they heard the Holy Spirit. And I believe they experienced more healing than they would have received had they come forward because all of a sudden they got it is, I, I got to be here for people that are hurting way worse than me. Jesus says this, you must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. You know, Jesus actually says in Luke 6 that God is good to wicked, ungrateful, evil people. Anybody know some wicked, ungrateful, evil people? God is good to them. So the next time you're mad, you're like, I don't understand. I do everything right and God doesn't bless me and he blesses them. Yeah, that's what Jesus says. He blesses wicked, ungrateful, evil people. But blessed are you. Blessed are you who are suffering now. Why? Because you're going to be blessed on the other side. God is going to reward your faithfulness. He promises. How will he reward your faithfulness? Listen to this. Luke 6, 38. Give and you will receive. What did that couple do? They came forward to receive. They got out of line and they gave. What does he say will happen? Your gift will return to you full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more and more. Poured into your lap. So what you give, God compresses overflows, pours into your lap. He says, the amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Jesus says, look guys, being a follower of Jesus is not about getting, it's about giving. But I promise you this, I will pay you back a hundredfold whatever you invest in my kingdom for my sake. Being a Christian is not easy, but Jesus Christ promises it will be the greatest decision of your life. Can you imagine how the world would view Christianity if we all live like this? Can you imagine? Those Christians are nuts, but they are good, right? The problem is many of us carry the label, but we don't listen to the lesson. Actually, in Luke 6, Jesus asks this question. He says, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? Why do you call me Lord? Why why would you do that? Because for many of us, Christianity is an external wrapping hiding an internal problem. Why is our vision to be real? Because every single one of us falls short. Every single one of us struggles. Every single one of us is a mess. I mean, let's be honest. I struggle loving my wife all the time, much less my enemy. That's where my heart is. God needs to do a miracle in my heart, in my life, and he needs to do it in yours. Here's the good news. You don't have to do this alone. Jesus knows you can't. So he sent his Holy Spirit to help you. To help you do what you know you should do, even when it's not what you want to do. I love you guys. I hope you will read Luke 6 this week. I hope you'll read it over and over again. And I hope you'll pray about it and say, God, change my heart so that I want to do this. Change my heart so I want to love my enemies. Change my heart so I don't care about how much money I make. Change my heart so I am a different person. 
Change my heart so I respond in a different way. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this amazing church and these amazing people. Lord, I love them so much. I'm so blessed, Lord, to be the leader of this church that allows me to be real. But God, I pray that they would allow themselves to be real and give themselves permission to admit none of us in here comes anywhere close to obedience in Luke 6. Jesus, we need you. We need you now more than ever because we can't do this on our own. We need your Holy Spirit. We need your guidance and we need your direction. And ultimately what we need is we need for you to change our hearts. So please, Father, help us in this area. Transform our hearts, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.